I'm so excited that you are here um, to talk with us today. Thank you for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I I always enjoy uh, getting the chance to talk with you about spooky things. Yes, it's so fun. So speaking of spooky things, I'm dying, no pun intended, uh, (laughs) to know... (laughs) Did you grow up in a house uh, or with a family who told ghost stories? Did your did your family believe uh, in ghosts, and uh, were they a spooky crew? Not at all. No, uh, I don't think they they believed in ghosts. I think um, we were we were. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like judgmental, but I think we were a rational, very rational family. Um, uh, we. Uh, I was raised Jewish. I'm still, uh, I still consider myself culturally Jewish. Uh, but we would go to, you know, I went to uh, Hebrew school and all that stuff when I was a kid. And we would go to temple for the holidays and whatnot. But even then, I never felt like our family was particularly spiritual either. I think it was really just a sort of, these were our traditions. We would, you know, go to synagogue and, and whatnot. Um, but I think in terms of ghosts, uh, or, or the paranormal. I think that would have definitely been a step too far for my parents and, and my brother. Uh, I, on the other hand, as a kid, had a, a crazy wild imagination. Um, I used to love uh, scary movies and, and I had all sorts of scary toys. Um, I loved playing with, uh, with plastic dinosaurs and my mother told me one time that you know the scarier the dinosaur apparently was the, was this the more I wanted to play with it, so so I think I was always leaning towards that stuff. Whether or not I believed in ghosts, I don't I don't know. Um, I'm you know I think in the dark of night when you hear a sound that you can't explain, then yeah, you definitely believe in ghosts. But in in the you know in in the bright light of day, I'm not sure I, I ever truly believed. So as a horror suspense, urban fantasy author, um, and as a child who loved to play with spooky, scary things, did that have a kind of seductive glamour to you? I think, um, I think yes. And I think what it mostly was, was I was a very lonely kid. I wasn't very outgoing. I didn't have a lot of friends, uh, but I had a lot of imagination. I did a lot of what they call imaginative play, which is basically when you're, let's say you have two action figures and you have a conversation between them. Um, but I think the loneliness that I felt as a kid, especially growing up in um, the suburbs where I did, or almost a rural town, uh, translated to a love of monsters because I think monsters in many ways and, and uh, are, are stand-ins for lonely kids. Um, or, or for children, even uh, even not lonely kids. But I mean, like the Frankenstein. Think of things like the Frankenstein monster and stuff like that. He's the, the epitome of a lonely kid. He's just trying to make friends, and he's he's messing up every chance he gets because he looks weird and he doesn't know how to talk to people. As a kid, I looked weird and didn't know how to talk to people. So I think that there was that correlation there. Um, uh, and I think that's a difficult thing for people who aren't into spooky stuff to understand. I think um, there's this idea that as a kid, you're scared of ghosts, you're scared of monsters. And and to a certain extent, that's true. But I think you also relate to them. I think you also sort of have sympathy for them because they are so similar to yourself. I'm so excited to hear you say that. That's not something that you hear people talk about a lot in terms of, of the ways you might sympathize with a monster, with a demon, with a ghost, with a vampire. Um, I was always utterly beguiled by those things on the other side while being also nervous of them and afraid of them. Um, Oh, yeah. I I used to always say, like, uh, uh, I I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but I also don't want one to appear to me. You know, I'd be too scared. Like, you know, if there, if there are any ghosts listening right now as, as we're having this discussion, don't appear to me. <laughs> I don't want to see you. Right. I'm too scared of that. Be careful of what you might, what you might call in, you know. <laughs> it's, 
It's so funny. Yeah. I, I so so you have not yet to at this point in your life that you know of officially seen a ghost and or any other sort of energy or um, or had communication with the other side. Well, uh, I don't know. I saw something once, uh, and I don't know if it was a ghost or uh, my imagination or a visitation of some kind. I can, uh, but I was I was young, and I had, uh, as I said, I had a pretty wild imagination, and it was the middle of the night. So who knows? I, mean, I could have been dreaming with my eyes open. Uh, but um, uh, if you can, if you have a moment, I'll tell you this story because it's a little bit involved. Yes, um, this is exactly <laughs> why we brought you here. We want okay. You <laughs> so I grew up in Westport, Connecticut, uh, which is sort of a, a suburban slash rural area of Connecticut. Um, I lived on a road called North Ridge Road, which was a cul-de-sac. Uh, so it only had about maybe 11 houses. Uh, and then there was a lot of woods, uh, which, which you'll find all over Connecticut. There's a lot of woods in Connecticut. Um, my, my bedroom, I was very lucky. My brother and I had separate bedrooms. Um, my bedroom faced the back of the house and the backyard and the woods. Uh, and I was, like I said, you know, a, a very imaginative child. Um, and I would frequently wake up in the middle of the night uh, for reasons unknown. Uh, maybe, I, And then I would like turn on the light and read or maybe I would just try to fall back asleep. And I would sometimes hear things um, that maybe we're just sort of oral hallucinations or maybe we're real. I don't know. One, I remember one time hearing what I was convinced was a violinist playing the, you know, playing the violin in our backyard. And obviously uh, there was no violinist in the backyard. Uh, it was more likely I was hearing something from a neighbor's house or maybe my parents were listening to the radio or something. I can't really recall uh, how late at night this was, but I was convinced there was a spectral violinist in the backyard. Um, so that's just an example of what my imagination was like as a child. So this particular instance, I woke up in the middle of the night, which, as I said, was not unusual, turned on the light. Maybe I was, re no, I, I got out of bed for some reason. Maybe I went to the window to look and see what was outside. There was nothing outside. I didn't see anything. But when I turned back to the bed, I saw the very vague outline of a form sitting on the bed, a, a, a human form. Uh, and it was, you know how uh, it used to be like if you tuned the TV to a, a bad station, there would be like static, it would be like snow. Yeah. That's what the, in, the interior of this silhouette looked like to me. It looked like that kind of static. Mm. And it was just sitting on the bed. And I think, again, this has been uh, quite a few years since then, I think I saw it get up and walk out of the room. I don't know what it was, I, if it was imagination or if it was some kind of visitation. The next morning, I was talking with my brother, uh, who his bedroom was across the hall from mine. Uh, and we had, we had we both had early bedtimes because we were pretty young. And I remember I would shout. I thought I was being so, so like slick and sly. I would shout across the bedroom, like hey, across the hallway, like, hey, are you asleep yet? And he'd be like, no. And our parents would be like, shut up in there. Um, but so the next morning, uh, I guess at breakfast or something, I said that I said to my brother uh, that I had had this weird experience. And he said that he also had gotten up in the middle of the night and went to his window and saw lights in the sky. Oh. So I don't know what to make of that. There's, you know, my rational brain is just like, we were kids, we were probably half asleep. He might have, he might not even have been telling the truth when he said that. I don't know. All I can tell you is what I experienced and what I remember experiencing. Yes. And I really thought that I saw this vague outline of a human-like shape sitting on my bed and then getting up and, and leaving the room. That is so, so well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe, or, or is it your, are you inclined to think that children are more, oh, how old were you at the time? I must have been uh, single digits, so maybe 10 maximum. 10 maximum, okay. So do you, I, are you of the mindset that, that children are more open to seeing things in a wider scope because they haven't, they're not quite, 
you know, they, the world hasn't been perfectly explained to them. In other words, um, you know, the minute you name something, the minute something you're told what something is, it kind of boxes it in, right? And I, I think that, I, I mean, I certainly think that children, the younger they are, the more kind of attached they are to the other world. And I think that that's why so many spooky things will happen around small children, or you'll hear them say wild, um, creepy, uncanny things. And and then it kind of ratchets up again, I feel like, in, in the hysteria of being a teenager sometimes. Um, and then again, at the end of our life, right, when we're transitioning out and suddenly, um, you know, we've seen people, you know, or we hear stories about people seeing those who've crossed over that are back to get them. So I don't know, what's, what do you, what do you think, if you were going to put money on the fact that you actually did see something or it was your imagination, what do you think? Well, look, it's it stuck with me all these years. Like I'm, I'm 54 now, so this is over 40 years ago that I, that this happened, um, and it stuck with me. So I think there's a reason it stuck with me. It definitely had made an impression on me. Was it an alien visitation? Was it a ghost? Was it something from the other world? I can't answer that. I don't know because it never happened again, mm -hmm. and it didn't necessarily leave me with a trace of itself or or any sort of idea that I had been visited by something other than, wow, that was weird. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right about children. And I think um, looking at it from a, a possibly slightly different angle, I think kids are really open-minded because they are learning so much about the world still. So they're very open-minded. So you can, you know, you can tease kids and say, oh, you know, if, if you're not good, Santa Claus isn't going to give you presents and they'll believe you. So, you know, they're open minded. And I think kids are also very imaginative. And I think that that combination, if one does believe in things like spectral world and the other worlds and stuff like I think it leaves them open to it much more than we are as adults where we feel we do. We feel as adults that we know everything, right? We we were like, oh, I've lived so long. What's what's left in this world to to surprise me or whatever? But kids, kids are surprised every day by something new. And I think that really leaves them open to different kinds of experiences than we, we have as adults. Such different. I mean, even just the way, I, so, you know, in, in tarot, which is my area of expertise, mm. the, um, pages, the pages, which are the youths of tarot, there's four of them in the deck. They represent um, that right before puberty. Um, kind of sweet spot. And I think that one of the the magical things and enjoyable things that we can all remember from when we were kids are, is even just our sense of time. How incredibly, when you're like six or seven in first or second grade, like how long just the beginning of the school year is until the holiday break? I mean, it's an eternity. Oh my God. As an adult, f you know, four years speed by, but I don't remember the four years of high school or even of uh, the years before that, uh, going this quickly. Yeah, and ever and it, it was seems so cool. long, so long, and so viscerally alive too. When you th when when I think back to being a kid, or when I try and move into that energy again for myself, just as an adult, because because I think it's it's I think it's truly um, living on a moment to moment basis, right? And 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 with that, it's almost tantric in its intensity um, of of paying attention not only to how you're feeling but also what you're experiencing yeah and everything is dialed up to 11 at that age too right i mean you feel like everything is life or death that goes with you into uh high school and maybe college too but everything every little thing feels like life or death oh i hope she likes me if she doesn't like me i'll just die you know like <laughs> true oh it's so it's so so true so you spent half of your childhood in i would say of your formative years your young formative years in westport connecticut and then you moved yes i moved back to new york city when i was 12 to new york city when you were 12 so did you ever have anything spooky or strange happen to you in the streets of new york because it's certainly an intense place to live with lots of energies flying around I have something strange happen to me in the streets of New York almost every day, but I'm not sure I would call them <laughs> spooky. <laughs> it's usually just uh, somebody acting erratically in the subway or, or who knows. Um, but I, I did have something happen to me just, this was just a couple of weeks ago here in my apartment. Um, so I was taking a shower 
Uh, it was so. It was. It must have been. It was the morning. I was taking a shower, um, singing "Easy Lover" by Phil Collins to myself because that's what it, I only sing in the shower, and I had I had heard that song again recently, and it was stuck in my head. It's catchy. It's a catchy. It's, one. it's a catchy song. You know, uh, complete tangent. But I never thought of myself as a Phil Collins fan, uh, but. Uh, I, I know the words to like 99% of his songs and they're all very catchy. Yeah, it's a, they're um, wonderful stories. <laughs> uh, but of course, in the shower, I often change the lyrics to songs to be about my cats, which is a totally normal thing that cat owners do. <laughs> anyway, so I get out of the shower and I'm toweling off and I'm humming this song. And there's a knock at the bathroom door, just a single, single knock. Now, my wife isn't home. She's at this point, she's already left for her place of employment for the day. But we have cats. And I know that cats, uh, my cats don't like necessarily when there's a door between me and them. Uh, and they'll meow and they'll sometimes scratch at it. So I thought maybe that's what I heard. So I opened the door. There's nobody there. There's nothing there. The cats are both asleep, like on opposite sides of the apartment, nowhere near the bathroom. So I close the door, go on with my routine. Uh, there's no further knocks. It doesn't happen again. Um, but it was very clearly a knock. So I thought to myself, well, maybe it was one of the cats. Uh, they just made a noise in the apartment somewhere, and I heard it louder than, than I expected. Or maybe it was from a neighbor or, or anything, some noise that my brain interpreted as a knock on, on the door. Mm -hmm. But because it didn't happen again, I don't know. I don't know what it was. You know, was it was it just a noise that I heard? Was it a ghost? I don't know. But I'll say this. Because it didn't happen again. If it was a ghost, the sight of me naked was so terrifying that it immediately fled for the next plane of reality. <laughs> I I don't think so. I think it was a message from the other side that clearly you have a recording, um, you know, a singing career. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. And it, it was, was a message. To keep going. Keep going with the Phil Collins cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Phil Collins himself has not passed over yet, so it couldn't have been him. But uh, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? That, so that was just a, a weird experience. I've never had anything like that happen before because the apartment I live in is is brand new. Uh, it was a new construction. Uh, my wife and I were the first people to move in, so it doesn't have a history. Like nobody passed away here, or nobody had lived here before. Um, so it really, it's uh, there haven't been uh, before that there haven't been any spooky moments. But I, I, I you know, I it it seems to me, and again, I don't. I, you know, I wouldn't swear by any of this when I when I talk about my theories of the invisible world um, and the paranormal and the supernatural. But it does seem to me that um, places can be haunted, not energies can be attached not only to a house, like especially like old houses or places with history, but I think often um, to people themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, for instance, my mother had moved in uh, with us right before about a few months before the pandemic um and it was very clear that she brought an energy with her interesting and it was not a friendly energy whatsoever. interesting yeah and i i um had felt it and and i and i'll, I'll preface this by saying i you know, I write about tarot and the paranormal, but I, I, I would call myself a skeptic because I really, I really, when something is actually happening, I want to know that it's happening. And I think it's important for people who do like creative and metaphysical work to try and, you know, delineate that space between the creative imagination and when something is actually happening and even have some sort of parameters to kind of figure those out. But um, mm. but I, I I literally had to, at a certain point, go down into the kitchen where it seemed to be residing in the pantry um, walkthrough. And I, I had to ask for it to leave because it was nefarious and it was dark and it did leave. Um, so I, I, the whole reason I even bring it up is, I don't know, do you think that people carry energies as well? And that, that do you know, does that ring true for you? 
I mean, I, I think it sounds really, really interesting and, and possible. And I'm, I'm sort of, I'm still sort of in awe of the fact that there was this nefarious presence in your apartment and all you had to do was ask it to leave. And it was like, okay, it was like, it was like, I'll go. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this was actually, it was in my farmhouse. Um, uh -huh. Not in the, uh, the, I never have my mother move into the New York city apartment. It's much it's too, too small. small. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, um, but like, you know, you hear about when you hear about cleansing a home, mm -hmm. you hear about rituals and mm -hmm. the burning of sage and all this stuff, but yes. I'm just, it's, it's so cool to me that you were just like, Hey, you should, you should go. And this entity or whatever was like, okay, I'm out. Yeah. Well, I think that that that's one of the interest. I think it's your first, uh, for me, it's always my first go-to and what I would talk about, like in the classes that, that I teach that, you know, that any, that, again, this is just my inclination of what I believe. I don't have hard and fast proof other than my own experience of it, but that, that things on the other side are, um, just the same as things on this side, maybe just in a, a different form. So, you know, in witchcraft, if you are petitioning a god and asking for help or working with a plant or an animal with that energy, then you would create a relationship with it like you would with a person. Mm -hmm. um, and and then the same thing, you know, and I, I'll, often, I'll often use kind of working with the other side um, energies or exploring the other side with New York City as an analogy to, you know, you would walk the streets of like, you know, East 28th Street at 4 a.m. in a much different way than you would, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon. So the right. same things um, hold true. But I think that, I think that certainly just addressing it, letting you know that you like some, that thing, let, letting it know that you see them and you're aware of them and putting down some boundaries, just like with a human being, is often your first step and will often take care of it. Um, not always, not always. Do you, do you know why it was sort of attached to your mom? Like did, why she brought, how she was able to bring it with her? Yeah. Well, um, again, this is my conjecture, um, but she's, uh, she is not now she's, she's quite wonderfully in the moment and it now, um, but she's intense and, mm. and has a very grinding dark energy. Mm. Um, and, and I think that, I think that it's an interesting thing when you look at somebody energetically, when somebody is kind of in, in trauma or sad or upset, you know, every, all of our, um, all of our natural reaction is to go over and, and comfort that person. Right. Whereas if somebody's like happy and excited and la la la, life is great. And their energy is expansive like this. People are like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know that I hear that. So I think that I think that for certain personalities, I think there's certain um, shades of darkness, like attracts like. And I think mm. that um, she's had a number of, of, of things with her her entire for most of her life. So it wasn't surprising to me, but I didn't I didn't like it. Yeah. That's so fascinating to me. Me too. This idea that uh that there are other uh, beings out there, right? That are invisible and are drawn to your energy. Um, it's fascinating. You know, I used to think, uh, I, I, you know, in movies when someone is possessed by a demon, right? There's always like, you know, there's some scary demon and it possesses uh, more often than not a young girl in these movies because they all, they're all take they're all ripped off of the exorcist pretty much. But anyway, I used to think like, what, what do these demons do between possessions? Like, what are they doing in their off time? Is their world like our world where they're just like, they have administrative stuff they have to do between possessions? Just like, or do, do they have like upper management that they have to like report to? It's such a great question, isn't it? <laughs> if, they, if they had that much power to like take over a body and then like, then, and, and they had, they could like, there's no way they couldn't get out of their like exorcist restraints. Like, I'm sorry, there's just, well, yeah. you're floating and puking and defecating. <laughs> and like what you can't, you can <laughs> use the energy to throw the crease across the room, but you can't break out of like the, the sad little ropes holding you. To right. Or, like, just, right. Yeah, it doesn't. With, I, demonic possession is something that's so I, that so fascinates me. I got to see, watch uh, a demonic possession. I got I want to watch I I watched um, 
someone possessed in a church service one day. And For it was real? So fascinating. Yeah, it was in a it was in a Baptist church service, and again, speaking of energy, like I felt the energy of what was going on. But and before I even turned to look, I was like, oh, she's possessed, you know? And oh my god. And it was a whole thing and it lasted for quite some time for most of the service. And it was a big gregarious service. They had a house band on stage, you know, people were receiving, it was amazing energy in there. And, um, and she was kind of fighting it off. They had quartered her. So we asked the pastor, Pastor Derek at the end, you know, um, was that normal? <laughs> Is she going to be okay? And he's like, oh yeah, it happens. You know, it happens from time to time. He's like, usually they feel a lot better, um, you know, after the possession, but she's going to need to pray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a particularly strange. tough one, but you know, it made me think, you know, is this is it a learned behavior possession, like speaking in tongues? You know, I don't know that, uh, you know, and and I, I'm just being curious about it. I'm not passing judgment on, on yeah. any of these practices, but um, a Buddhist friend of mine who's a scholar uh, of Tibetan Buddhism who's going to be on ghost stories, um, you know, he'll say mental illness in one culture, you know, is a possession in another mm. that that odd place, um, that space between mental health and, and the supernatural. And I don't know, it's, it's fascinating stuff. You've never seen an exorcism or a possession before in real life. No, um, just, just in the movies. And so I sort of, in my mind, that's where it, it exists. Right. So it's hard for me to imagine it in real, in the real world. Yeah. It's, it was violent. It was violent. It was, it was violent. What was happening for her was violent. And then wow, it must've been pretty scary to witness. It was very scary. It was very uncomfortable. Like, you know, the ener you know, energetically speaking, something was definitely happening. What wow. was it? I don't know, but. Um, so you're, you, you're tuned into energy. Like you, you can feel energy probably better than I can or better than maybe most people can. I don't know. I mean, I think we all have different um, sort of superpowers, but you, you are, you're an author and you've written many, many books and short stories and novels. Mm. I think that there's a sensitivity in that. Um, so I, do you, do you ever, I'm, I'm curious, do you feel like there is an innate creative consciousness of the stories that come through you? In other words, when you get an idea for a story, do you feel like this is something that is um, separate from me that wants to come through me and be made real or uh, how does, how does that work for you? What is your creative process like? Uh, I don't, it doesn't come to me that way. I, I don't feel like, um, you know, some people talk about having a muse and the muse is speaking to them. It's never really felt like that for me. Um, uh, I'm more of uh, an observer and that's, that's where um, my creativity comes from. I, 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 I see things or I learn things and then I, put them together in strange combinations and that's how I get my ideas. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, this idea of, of muses goes back so far. And it's, it's really interesting to think about how humanity, uh, humankind has been try struggling with this idea of where do ideas come from? I, I'm not sure we, we even really know now because I, I don't think there's any other creature on this planet that, creates an exact in that kind of way yes um and so, I th so much of that i think has to do with our having language but this idea of of coming up with stories on our own like uh, like where did that come from yeah. i don't know it, it it goes back to you know maybe those first uh uh fires in the caves right where people were relating their their tales of of hunting mammoths or whatnot and then there's this maybe there's one guy that was like yeah I hunted a saber-toothed tiger and it went like this. And he's like making up the story as it goes along. And maybe that was like the first kind of story that there ever was where somebody was just sort of like, you know, fictional story. I mean, where somebody was just like, yeah. So then I, you know, went after this saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We um, thought there was blood. I prevailed. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I, I left the body out there. <laughs> I left the tiger. I couldn't bring it back. But it's, a um, but it's a really interesting thing that everything that we see around us, everything that's surrounding you right now in your office was once an idea in someone's head. Yeah, before it actually yeah. existed in real life. That's weird that's cool. magic manifestation. It is so cool. And 
And I think that that's why stories matter so much, do you know, because, um, you know, other people show us what's possible and, and certainly in stories and, and, um, for, for better or for better or for worse. So what would you say in, um, do most of your stories end on a high note, a curious note? Uh, are they ambiguity? Like, tell me. How about... uh, it depends on the story. Uh, I, I don't think I necessarily have a uh, particular uh, recurring uh, uh, way of ending a story. Um, but, uh, you know, it depends. Uh, for, for the novels that I've written, uh, they're, they're, there might be a little twist in the tale at the end, like a sort of, you know, does the evil continue kind of thing. Uh, but uh, with short stories, they might be more ambiguous. Um, I like ambiguity in, in short stories. I respond to it because I think it, it lights me up a lot more than, than like seeing, you know, seeing the monster is fun, but wondering if there really is a monster it sticks with me. Like, I like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I try to capture that as much as I can in my short stories. But in, in novels, I, I'm, I'm usually a little bit more more solid about what's going on and, and how it's resolved. Um, but what, what you were saying... Oh, what? I was just going to say, what you were saying before about how everything in this office was once an idea and it was made real, that's how I think about uh, books and, and novels in particular, fiction in particular. What an incredible thing that is. Somebody had an idea and they decided to put it down on paper. And now it's something I'm holding in my hand and, and partaking in, sharing in, uh, uh, peeking into the, the, the mind of that writer through a physical object. It's, it's breathtaking when you think about it, like that they have summoned this thing into the world through the power of their imagination. That's incredible to me. And people are ingesting it, reading it, without speaking all of none none of it is with none of it is with words um mm -hmm. it happens across time right we can right. read charles dickens or yeah it's, you're and peeking Paul. into charles dickens brain and yes. he's been dead for a long time yes which is why libraries and bookstores are such spooky wonderful stacked places to be don't you think when like, i love I, it Oh, you, I, I, I love the feel of walking into a bookstore, even if I don't buy anything because I have so many books at home already that I haven't read. I don't need to buy more books, but I go in there and I will always wind up buying something anyway. Uh, I just love, I love the energy of a bookstore. I love the people that I see in bookstores, mm -hmm. complete strangers, but their, their, their nose, their noses are in these books mm -hmm. and they're learning something or they're having an experience. It's incredible to me. Incredible. What, and I have to ask you this, what would you say is one of the scariest stories you've ever read? Ever read? Wow. Um, okay, so this it's a dopey, like, 1970s horror novel um, called The Lizard's Tale by, I think, Mark Brandle. And it was made into a movie by Oliver Stone called The Hand. And so it's about this cartoonist. I think he's a cartoonist. He's an artist of some form who loses his hand uh, in a car accident and he's no longer able to make his art. So he's just stewing in bitterness uh, and resentment. And everyone that he sort of dislikes now winds up mysteriously dead. And he starts to think that it's his hand, like his severed hand has come to, has come to life on its own and is murdering these people. It's sort of ambiguous in the novel, but in the in the movie, it's very much like that's that's absolutely what's happening. Like the you know the, they show the hand crawling around and stuff and and killing people. Uh, but there's uh, you know it's 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 certainly possible in the book that he's doing it and he doesn't know that he's doing it, right? And he's putting the blame on this severed hand that he imagines is killing them. But there's a moment in the book where uh, he receives a shoebox, like a mysterious shoebox appears for him and he opens it up and there's like this, there's a thing inside that I, I don't want to give away that was so shocking to me um, that indicating that somebody he actually liked had also been murdered, uh, that I dropped the book. <laughs> it fell out of my hands. <laughs> 
that's, was... that's rarely happened to me. That's 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 not something. I'm. So, it's so hard for me to get scared by reading, because for me, fear is very. It's very visual and it's very auditory. Like if I hear a, a creepy noise in a movie or something like that, I, I know to get to get worked up. Uh, but on the page, it's very hard to scare me or shock me. And I draw. I this one did. I just I draw, wound up like ah, oh, and I dropped the book. <laughs> It's been out of print for years, and I hope somebody brings it back because it's a really fun story. Oh, that's that's so awesome! So, when <laughs> I was, curious, was it more disconcerting um, because it, it may have been him that was actually yeah. like? Well, so it was what he finds in the box. Again, I don't want to say, but it's a very intimate body part, and <laughs> it was just very shocking. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so scary! Um, <laughs> so, yes. and it's a, it's a really cool idea for a, for a book too. Like this, you know, this idea of like all these people that you dislike are dying mysteriously, and you're sure it's not you doing it, but you think that it is connected to you somehow. That's really creepy. That's t- well. Do you ever do you ever do those crazy like thought um, exercises in your head where you're like, what if my waking life is a dream? So the comedian Sarah Silverman has this bit that she does where she says she's worried that this is a dream and she's actually like in an old age home somewhere, like masturbating in a closet. <laughs> They're going to come and find her. <laughs> Seriously, I, you know, I, I just it, it, it's a very funny thing. Like I, I, I often will imagine like my moment of death and looking back and like. I like to think, oh gosh, if your whole life flashes before your eyes. Right. How do we know we're not in that flash right now? Exactly. Exactly. Exactly mm-hmm. that point. And and if I have like a really amazing moment, I'll be like, oh, this is definitely one of those end of life flashes. Like I'll definitely, you know, be seeing this again. But it seems entirely plausible if, if we were to find out that the whole thing was just um, a hallucination. It, almost makes sense in a weird way. Well, it's, it? it's so weird because we're so locked into our own heads, our own existences. We're seeing only through our own eyes. It's hard, you know, sometimes you have to wonder, like, do these other people really exist? Or is this like, is this all a dream state? And I'm just some free floating consciousness uh, yes. amusing myself. Like I've created this, this entity called Sasha Graham, who I'm now talking to. Right. It's I know it's a it's very solipsistic and it's probably psychotic, but it's it's something I think that 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 we all think of once in a while. Like, is the world around me real? Is it real? Have you ever this this happened to me not too long ago and it freaks me out to no end, but I love it at the same time. Have you ever unexpectedly seen someone, your spouse or a good friend on the street when you didn't expect to see them? And, and so it, it's, but they didn't see you seeing them. And so you're looking at this person walking down the block or maybe getting into the car and going, that human over there is the person that I've had children with or spent the last mm-hmm. 30 years of my life with. Mm-hmm. They look as ordinary as every other person. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. And I take it one extra ridiculous step. I'm like, they didn't see me because I'm a ghost. <laughs> like how could my good friend not have seen me on the street i'm a ghost <laughs> we are spirits in the material world <laughs> that's right the, the sting was correct he was oh god he, was so, he, he got so many things right he got so many things right so <laughs> do you mind can we talk about the tarot for a moment oh, i'm fascinated look- by tarot as well Yes. Uh, I've always liked tarot. I've never been able to read it. I don't have the ability, I think, to see the images and, and draw meaning from them in the same way. Or maybe it's just not, maybe it's, I haven't learned how to do it. Um, but you've created tarot decks. You've created those images yourself. Mm-hmm. Do those images, I don't mean to turn the interview around on you, but do those, two, do those images come to you in some sort of, I don't know, trance or dream state or from someplace else? Oh, well, yes. And oh, oh, my gosh, thank you for asking this question, which I'm super happy to talk about. So number one, tarot, um, tarot is a language, it's a visual language that is grounded in esoteric theory. So it is something that can be learned like French or Italian, or 
anything else. Um, so that just takes a matter of practice um, and, and the desire to do that. Anybody can read a card, um, but anybody can, any, it's visual. So anybody can also read a card and just tell the story of what they see on the card and relate that either to the person they're reading for or to themselves. Um, but as far as the images on the card, so what's, what makes tarot different than a regular like uh, deck of playing cards, there's 78 tarot cards are the major arcana. And the major arcana are these major archetypal energies and archetypal energies is something that anyone from any culture, no matter where they grew up, what their um, religious system was like, uh, would understand what an archetypal energy is. So an example is mother or father. Everybody, every, every human on this planet understands the idea of mother or father, death, um, uh, uh, when things fall apart in the tower, love, right? So, so, so archetypal energy, it's, it's really phenomenal because it, um, it really is what grounds us all as human beings. And we're so much more alike than we are different. You know, again, the difference is that's just material world, right? That's just like the pentacle, the pentacle level. So when I'm designing a tarot deck, um, and at this point, like tarot, tarot is, all, how can I explain this? So tarot is the energy of tarot, because so many people have worked with it for so many centuries, it does hold its own collected energy. So the same way if you were an herbal witch, say, and you went out and were collecting, I don't know, lavender to work with lavender to help you sleep better, or perhaps uh, motherwort because you wanted to soothe something that was uneasy in yourself, or... Um, or uh, uh, a hollyhock, you know, if you were working on your heart, the same way that you would work with the energy of the plant, it has its own intelligence. Um, so is there an intelligence in the archetypes of tarot? So if, if, if the occultist or the witch or the practitioner chooses to, you can work with the energies of, of those cards. And certainly when I'm creating a tarot deck, um, that energy, which is very fluid. And the energy, I believe, of tarot, like anything else, the, the more that people go in and use it, the more expanded it becomes. You know, it's the first thing you realize when you when you start to do um, nature magic is that you're not the first person in there. You can sort of feel the footsteps or the footpaths of those who kind of ventured before you. So everybody who goes in to do some kind of work is expanding that experience. Um, so working with the archetypes of tarot is probably just like working with the archetypes and the tropes of a novel, do you know? Um, and so, yeah, for like the father emperor energy, um, that's what's coming through. But it, it's, it's, it's a little more direct, I think, because you can really access that energy um, particularly and appeal to it, ask it what it wants to be, how it wants to reveal itself, um, yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. It, it sounds very creative. It sounds like not that different from writing. Oh, it's not. No, I mean, it's not at all different from writing. I don't think there's any difference except for the fact that what it what is what I find nice about tarot is it's very concise in its structure, while as fiction and poetry and prose have uh, essential rules and things that people adhere to. Um, and tarot is a nice, neat package. Do you know, um, so that yeah. Thank you. Sure, I have the Weight Rider deck somewhere around this yes. messy office, uh, but uh, you've really opened my eyes to the fact there are so many other decks out there. Some of them with really gorgeous art. Yeah, yeah, and I think what's what's beautiful about tarot is that, and I, I've talked about this to other authors, that I, is that tarot is kind of evergreen. You know, when you create a, a tarot deck or you work anyone who works with tarot. Um, when they're working with it on a daily basis, they really, it really becomes a, a sacred relationship and like this kind of love object. And so unlike a novel that you've had your experience or a movie where you have the experience and then you leave and maybe it's still like on your bookshelf and it's like a totem that you think of and smile every time you look at it. With tarot, it, it, it's a world that you're, you're repeatedly going into and then using to work out all your stuff with mm. so 
becomes a very, it's a very evergreen, intimate um, universe to create, which mm -hmm. makes me really happy. You know, I, I briefly, uh, I was briefly a Wiccan in my, in my teen years. I was in a coven of one. I had my, uh, uh, a book of shadows that I bought from, from the magical child, that store that used to be on 19th street. Um, and uh, I would burn incense uh, in my room while I was doing these rituals. I had an athame, I had the whole thing. So my mother was very concerned about me because I was burning incense in my room. And she, she sort of had a talk with me one day and I said, are you smoking pot in your room? Because she thought I was using the incense to mask the smell of pot. And I said, no, I'm doing witchcraft. And I, <laughs> I, think, I think that was an even worse answer than I could have given her. <laughs> Was it, well, so wait, let me ask you, did you set out to be a solitary witch or was that just that you were the only person around? I was the only person. Well, A, I was the only person around and B, uh, I had not yet come out of my shell at that age. I was very shy. I didn't know how to talk to people, approach people, uh, ask, ask of people anything I needed, such as, do you have a coven <laughs> and is there room for one more? Um, so I just I just did my own thing. Uh, I didn't stick with it. I think this was just during a phase where I was trying to find myself. So I was trying a bunch of different things. Um, and I really, I was fascinated by it. I read all sorts of books about it, but it, I think it turned out not to be for me. Oh, well, you know, and back then, I'm guessing this is like the 80s. Oh yeah, mid to late 80s. The mid to late 80s. It was really, it, it, even if you did have like the hood spot to say, <laughs> hey, anybody around here know where I need to find a coven? Like even if you were articulating <laughs> They weren't easy to find, you know. No, Which I I wonder if I had gone to back to the Magical Child or there was another store called Enchantments uh, in the village. That was another sort of Wicca store. They probably could have hooked me up. They probably could have said, oh, yeah, I know these folks. Why don't you talk to them? But I was too shy. I just I just didn't have it in me. So we've got we've got a great story from you from our live event involving the Magical Child. But for the people who are just to this interview right now. Could you explain to everybody what the magical child in New York City was and why it was so interesting? It was, a, it was an interesting and sp it was a spooky store. Uh, I know people who would go into that store and immediately get bad vibes from it. <laughs> like it was it was a spooky store, but it was a it was a place where you could buy um, spell books, amulets, um, uh, incense, uh, if you wanted something dopey like the Parker Brothers Ouija, Ouija boards, they had those too. It was just, it was, a, it was very much a sort of, I call it, you know, without without meaning any offense, I call it a very witchy store. Um, and so it had all sorts of that kind of stuff. Uh, it was um, run by somebody who I think might have been in, a friend of Anton LaVey's or something like that. He had a he had a dark energy, this guy, uh, and so and, and that really seeped into the store itself. So I would go there from time to time looking for books about Wicca, looking for interesting jewelry. Like I, I bought a bunch of really cool rings and necklaces at the time from that place, probably not even understanding what what they were supposed to symbolize or, or what uh, uses they might have in ritual. I was just like, that's a cute ring. I'll, <laughs> I'll buy that. Um, so, yeah, this is the danger of giving uh, uh, teenagers allowances. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> it was a very cool store, though, and I do kind of miss it. It's a it's a restaurant now on 19th Street. It doesn't look anything. I think it, it was a Spanish place. And now I think it's something else. Uh, it doesn't look at all the same on the inside. So because that would be weird. Like if you're eating at this restaurant, and you look around like, wait a minute. Wasn't this the magical child? Uh, but it was. It was an interesting place. It was a cool place. And it, it definitely did have a weird vibe to it. So uh, I never, as much as I enjoyed going there, it's interesting. And looking back now, I never put this together in my mind until this minute. I loved going there, but I always wanted to leave pretty quickly. And I, th I think that I was picking up on that sort of dark, dreary vibe that was in there. There was definitely a standoffish energy in there um, that I felt as well when I would venture down there. Gosh, I was probably like 19 or 20 when I was poking around in there. And I, and I, never, I never understood 
if it was a witchcraft place, like why they would be as standoffish as I had found the Catholic Church to be when I my mother had married a Catholic and I found them incredible, like incredibly standoffish and snotty. And like, I didn't know the rituals and like I was some kind of an idiot because like I hadn't, like, <laughs> when am I born with this knowledge? Like I've never, you know, done before. And that's something I've actually never appreciated about uh, metaphysics and witchcraft in general, which is why I've always strived to be really open and transparent in talking about magic and the supernatural, um, because it's part of all of us. It's not for an an exclusive few. So I've always thought that, um, yeah, I've always thought that was an odd correlation. But enchantments, enchantments, which was in the East, or is in the East Village. That was I think more it's of, still around. Yeah, yeah. The, that's more of like the feminine um, kind of home. Would you say of magic in New York City back in the day and today? Possibly. Yeah, I didn't go there as often, um, but I went there a few times and it had a better vibe. It really did. Much better vibe than uh, the Magical Child. Uh, it's funny, you know, the Magical Child. They were very protective uh, of. Uh, of knowledge and and culture and it it makes me feel like i don't know they didn't want customers (laughs) in in a weird way like i think they would have been just as happy if nobody had ever showed up at the store and then they could just hang out with their with their robes and their daggers and do whatever um but i loved uh, you know i as weird as it was and as as much as i wanted to get out of there every time i was there there was just something about that place that kept drawing me back. I was fascinated by the paranormal, by the supernatural. Again, I think it started actually just with a love of horror and suspense and moved into like, well, what if some of this is real? Not like the truly scary stuff, but what if things like magic are real? What if I were able to, I mean, this is a little sad, I guess, but what if I were able to control my life better than I can as a teenager using the skills or the art or, or actual spells of magic. See, and that's, that's something interesting because, well, first of all, to me, there's a long history of the masculine use of magic, which is very much summoning a demon and commanding things and making things and that that, that sort of, um, yeah. So, but I do feel like people reach for witchcraft and of course like across all cultures do you know almost the less um almost the less uh power uh people have the more folkloric you know the more supernatural is what they will reach for because nobody can take that away from you right like your energy um it's so funny you say that because i wound up when i went to college studying folklore and i think there's a direct line uh through all of this uh, of of trying to find your power and where you belong. Exactly. And I think that's why tarot and witchcraft exploded during the pandemic, during the Me Too movement. Certainly social media, TikTok, Instagram gave um, an easy way for people to share that. Uh, and, it gave, and people who had time during the pandemic to study spiritual pursuits that maybe wouldn't have had the time otherwise. But I think that a lot of us felt like we were losing control. And I think that that's mm. why there was a huge surge of interest in, in witchcraft Interesting. Um, and tarot and magic. Um, but that it's was definitely a dark time, you know, yeah. when we were all stuck at home, locked down. Totally, for sure. I think it's interesting hearkening back to the the 70s and the 80s, but also how um, witchcraft, tarot, it it, it was almost like fetishized. Do you know? It was, it was, if you could get your hands on a tarot deck, it was almost that hard. It was, it was almost as hard to get your hands on a tarot deck as it was to get your hands on like a Playboy. Right. (laughs) Or like a dirty magazine. Like you'd be like, ooh. Uh, And it was like a party trick, right? Like, oh, you know, Brad's bringing a tarot deck to the cocktail party this Saturday. You know, be sure to be there. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. It's fun. Oh, my God. This is so great. So I want to ask you um, just what your inclination is based on your experience in life and and how growing up and just everything what do you feel where where do you think we were 
before we were born and where do you think we go when we die what do you think that looks like these are obviously age old questions um it's hard to know uh i don't i don't have a philosophy on that uh i i don't i think more probably because i'm in the second half of my life now i think more about where do we go after we die than where were we before we were born um i don't know you know it, the truth is either option is okay with me like do we go on or do we just sleep in darkness i'm okay with either one um i you know i make no bones about it i love to sleep <laughs> i enjoy sleeping uh and i'm sure that would be really peaceful uh the idea of going on also gives us as as living beings a, a bit of peace because we think well i've accumulated all this knowledge and and personality and and friends and loved ones and whatever and i kind of don't want to give that up so we have this idea that we we go on and that's that's a very peaceful um comforting idea so really if it's either one of those i think i think it's okay i like that it will be okay because everything will yeah. just be whatever it is right yeah unless we go into another like there's there are beliefs out there that you live your life over again like trying not to make the same mistakes <clears throat> either either as yourself or you reincarnated maybe as a different person right and that's that seems like a lot i don't know if i i want to do that like i yeah i've you know that's i've seen everybody's, enough everybody's walking around going oh no i know i'm an old soul <laughs> i know this is my last time <laughs> this is my last time around I, I have to be honest, I feel like uh, I've always felt the idea of reincarnation as being a very um, small way to look at an, an infinite universe, like mm. the idea that we would come just back to this little to the same world. place. Yeah. Yeah. Why? <laughs> you know, and and when, when people are getting their past lives done. You know, you always hear these, oh, I was it's always these dramatic. I was a princess. I was a king. I was a comp. You, like nobody was just like a poor little beggar on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was Cleopatra. I was King Tut. Uh, I was Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I was know? poor Bob that nothing like really happened to. Yeah, I was, I was Bob. I was King Tut's accountant. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I just, right? I don't know. And, and, and I do, I do realize the energy and, and patterns repeat. And I do, I was just talking with another guest on the show about um, trapped energy that seems to sometimes people like multiple people in like a hotel will see the same woman making the same pass. And this, I like, so I do believe in, in repetition for sure, but I don't think it's quite as literal. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would be surprised if reincarnation were true that we just came back to this same world. There's a whole universe out there. You know, maybe, maybe we, we will reincarnate as a being on a completely different planet where we have entirely new things to learn and experience. Right. Yeah. See, that sounds good to me rather than just coming back and living on earth again and trying not to make the same mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sasha, thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you so much for being part of Ghost Stories by the Fire. Do you have a spooky story, near-death experience, or supernatural happening you'd like to share? I'd love to hear it. Submit your story to sashagram.com with Ghost Stories by the Fire in the subject line. You might just wind up on this podcast. And if you want to support it and keep the ghost stories coming, head on over to sashagram.com to check out my books and tarot decks, which are available for purchase at your favorite bookseller. The Ghost Stories by the Fire theme song is titled Lovely from the original motion picture score of The Deeper You Dig, a film about the lengths a mother will go to to find her daughter's killer. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, I'm saving you a seat at the fire.